Welcome to the end of the world. Earth death is scheduled for 1539. Who the hell are you? Oh, I'm the doctor. This is Rose Tyler. She's my plus one. Is that all right? That's not supposed to happen. Representing the forest of Cheem, we have trees, the mocks of Balhoon, the face of Bo, the last human, the lady, Cassandra O'Brien. Oh, now, don't stare. Look in my ah! Heat levels rising. Heat levels rising. Welcome, everyone, to Discussing Who. We are glad that you are back, and we are glad that you have joined us for another episode. This is episode number 91, and on this episode, we will be covering the end of the world. And what is the end of the world? It is the 2005 Series 1 of Doctor Who, the second episode with the ninth Doctor and Rose Tyler. But before we get into the episode, it would not be discussing who if I didn't welcome back my co-host, Clarence Brown. Clarence, how are you? I'm doing good, man. Trying to stay warm. Trying to stay warm. It's, it's rather freezing today, but uh, <laughs> I'll survive. How are you doing, dude? I can't complain. You know, um, I'm sure there's people I'm listening in the UK, which I don't know how much uh, snow you guys get over there. So, Dave Cooper, if you're listening, you know, send us a message. Let me know. Do you get snow over there? That just popped into my head. Do they get snow over there? Uh, I think so. Pretty okay. sure. I'm pretty sure they probably do, too. <laughs> but we live, Clarence and I, in Mississippi, and normally snow is a rare occasion. And this is January 2015. Wow. January 2018. Wibbly wobbly there. And we're not used to having 15. Maybe that's where I'm getting 15 degree weather here. And not only that, snow at least two or three times in the last couple of months that's unusual for us yeah well i said the bright part is we're not in um kansas city or where, where my brother is and it's not negative two wind chill factor so uh, <laughs> i'll survive so how much <laughs> um how much snow do they have now um i have no idea <laughs> yeah i just knew it was cold he told me it was freezing there but i'm gotcha. pretty sure they're getting it got you got you got you well if you just as uh since you mentioned carrie carrie uh and Clarence also do another podcast called the Tech Tradition podcast, which you're now in season three, I believe. Yes. Cool. And I just want to say just off the side note, the new logo with the three on the side looks really cool. Just kind of FYI. Cool. Thanks, man. So we will be reviewing the second episode of the series from 2005. So if you have not seen this episode, The End of the World, we encourage you to put us on pause Go watch the episode. It is available on iTunes, but it is also available on streaming with Amazon Prime. So put us on pause, go watch the episode, and come back because from henceforth, spoilers. Spoilers. Affirmative. Spoilers. Spoilers. Affirmative. Spoilers. All right, so we are back. Spoiler warnings abound. And Clarence, question for you. Just sure, on up? the um, ballpark figure, how did you enjoy the episode? Um, Man, um, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, to me, it wasn't as fun as the Lat Rose was the first episode. Uh, but I did quite enjoy it. So I, I said it was, it was pretty good. What about yourself? You know, I... Well, let me answer it in two ways. Number one, one thing that I'm happy that you suggested we go back and do each episode from 2005 forward. It, it, I'm happy in the fact that it reminded me that there are some episodes that I have not watched repeatedly over and over and over. And the 2005 series, with the exception of Rose and with the exception of The Parting of the Ways, the 13th episode of this series, these are not episodes that I've repeatedly watched over and over. I remember what happened. I remember the stories. 
but I don't remember all the details. So I actually enjoyed watching this episode because there were some things that I didn't remember as well as, like I said, you know, maybe the parting of the ways. So yeah, I enjoyed it. What? A, so you, so you did, yeah. right? Yeah, and um, and you know, we've been talking about giving a lot of these early episodes a lot of flack for special effects not being that great. I feel like this one is mostly an ex- an exception. The for its time, I think the special effects are pretty good. And one thing we have to remember about these episodes, they were SD when they came out. Am I right about that? That is correct. Very yeah, so, good. So so they were not high definition. So we're watching them in a format that was not originally intended, first of all. But but still, I think the special effects still look fairly decent in this episode. Uh, and, you know, again, we we give them a lot of flack for the them not being that good early on. But I think they're I think they're OK. So I'm sitting here remembering back and thinking of the ones that were still, like you said, in SD. The first ones, it was either the specials from 2009 that led up to the end of time, or it was actually the end of time itself, part one and part two, that was first in HD. I'm, I can't remember if those other four specials, like the Waters of Mars and uh, the other the other special w- when they were in the um, dust, um, you know, the the desert planet. I can't remember the title of it, but it was those specials in 2009 or just the two part end of time, which were the first, you know, HD presentation. And then anything from, you know, 2010 forward has been in HD. Yeah. And I will say just to add on to that, I think the. I think the Amazon transfers are not as good as the Netflix transfers are. I don't know if it's just me being picky, <laughs> but it's, to me, it seems like the Netflix, whenever they did the conversion HD or however they encoded it, to me, they seem like they looked a lot better than uh, when it all got moved over to Amazon. All right. So interesting uh, that you said that because I can prove that you're correct and I'll tell you why. I did not start buying the entire season's. And I've, st- because I've always been able to stream them up until say the 2005 forward. Now, this particular episode I did have on, um, iTunes. So last night I started watching it. I don't know why, but I, <laughs> I started watching it on Amazon Prime and I noticed that the quality w- was not very good. And so I even went and checked to see if there was a setting like on Netflix where you can choose what you know, not energy consumption, but bandwidth consumption that you want per episode, which you, you know, couldn't regulate that. So I switched over and started watching it on, um, you know, an, on my iTunes on Apple TV. And I could tell a big difference just in the iTunes version that had been, you know, upped a little bit as opposed to the Amazon Prime. The quality was, you know, the, you know, there was a difference in the quality. So you're, yeah, you're uh-huh. right there. Hmm. So, you know, looking back, there's several characters that we meet for the first time in this episode that actually we see again or we see um, repeatedly again. Uh, case in point, Cassandra. Thoughts about Cassandra, the do last you, human. Do you know what? It's been so long since I watched you, I've, I've famously, I guess, many times said that I've only seen every episode exactly once, uh, with the exception of the last few seasons. I don't remember when we see Cassandra again. You see her I, one more time, and I won't tell you when, so spoilers, but you will, you will see her once again. One more time. Hmm. It seems like I remember that, but is it this season? It, it is not this season, to my knowledge, if I remember okay. correctly. Wow. Of, of course, we're going to see Face of Bo, uh, again. Yes. Uh, in many forms. Yes. <laughs> uh, but other than that, I can't think of anybody else on the ship that I remember seeing again. Uh, maybe now it seems like we see some aliens that are similar to the blue people. Yeah. Uh, especially in season 10, you know, the finale or this two part finale, because that, that it was a blue yep, person that, yep. that had a gun. I won't go any further than that, but had a gun in, in yep. that finale. Yeah, do you think that was the same race? I, unless, the, uh, bad joke here, unless the Blue Man group just expanded, I would say probably so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And it seems like there's some one other instance where there was a blue guy. What's the guy that got his head cut off in, somewhere in the future? Uh, uh, episodes. Can't remember, uh, I remember but I kind of know what you're talking about. I remember the blue head being oh, in the box, uh, and I can't my, my, remember what. Uh, pr- uh, not- not Professor Maldron, but whatever. But it's 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 the guy that was kind of like a smuggler and a yeah. arms dealer. Yeah, uh, that was in that was in season six. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. And his his head's in a box. So so I have to ask you, sir, uh, how many times that that you know of um, before this episode or henceforth, uh, where a companion has been given a choice where to go, past or future? Is it because it seems like I don't remember it as much in more recent seasons, um, but I definitely can seem seemingly remember it a few times early on. Yeah, I can remember, you know, there's probably been times that they have, you know, said, do you want to go here? I'm not saying that they didn't, but more in the classic era, even from the very beginning, that was one of the reasons why Ben and not Ben and Polly, but Ian and Barbara, when they actually went back, even if it was, I think, an, a year after when they left, they took a, you know, it was a chance that they landed in England close to their time. He really didn't have any control over it. So <laughs> back then, there was less of a, we're going you know, exactly, you know, a thousand years, we're going next year, we're going five million years or what. It was more left to chance. Uh, uh, and I wonder how many people would actually want to go in the past, because I know personally I would say future as well. So I, I agree with the rose there. <laughs> OK, so let me ask you this question. If if you had that. So you just answered one of those questions. Uh, you wouldn't go to go to the past. If you could go into the future, would you go into the future Earthbound or would you go into the future spacebound or to another planet or somewhere else? You know what? I think I'd want to see both. Uh, so I will just, I guess, take the easy out and say both. But one of the things that really, I guess, confuses me about this episode, you know, they have the whole exchange where he's spouting off places to where they could possibly go in the future. And Rose is like, oh, you're not impressing me. You know, kind of playful, uh, cheeky or whatever. And they get and he takes her to probably the saddest point he could possibly take her, which, uh, is, 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 well, end of the world, but the end of earth. Um, which I, I was just surprised why he would take her there for her first trip. All right. So I'm going to play armchair psychiatrist here. How about that? Sure. All right. Or armchair, whatever. Uh, so thinking of what the doctor might be thinking, Knowing now, without any spoilers, knowing where the doctor has just been and what the doctor has just been through, maybe that was a subconscious thing for him to see a dying planet. Hmm. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. You know, for but, him, for yeah. him, you know, uh, one thing that I found really interesting that I had really forgotten from watching it, you know, just over and over and not going back to these episodes was the mystery that they created around who the doctor was for new viewers to find out who he was. Case in point, the trees reading uh, and and saying, oh, no, this is not possible and not knowing who he is and saying this can't be true. And they still in this episode really didn't name what he was per se it was just kind of left ambiguous well they do say time lord well true 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 i forgot about yeah, that toward the end of, yeah, yes. near the end of the episode but but i mean I, I i do like that mystery around you know um you know introducing the doctor or reintroducing the doctor again to the audience and i, I like them having this certain amount of mystery around him but one of the things i guess maybe i asked you this question years ago and maybe gave me an answer i don't know okay the the gallifrey is destroyed um why can't he as a time lord and i know there's an answer for this but i don't know i still think i don't know why i just popped back up in my head again but as a time lord that can go anywhere in time and space how come he can't just visit the planet before or gallifrey before it got destroyed i know there's an answer but 
Uh, it still hurts my brain. So All right. So I what... remember at one point they have said that the events of the time war are locked. And assumption here, and I'm I'm channeling uh, Lee Shackelford at the moment, and, and when I say, you know, they've given me a reason and they're saying it, I don't necessarily have to agree with that reason, but at least they've given me a reason and I can wrap my head around it. <laughs> But having said that, I'm, I'm, I'm on your wave of thinking when you say, hey, why can't he go back to years before the time war even happened and, you know, what, what destroyed Gallifrey and all of that? Why can't he go back to all of that before it happened? My brain trying to explain things <laughs> then wants to say, well, maybe the way Time Lord science works, when they time locked the uh, time war, it time locked all of Gallifrey. Yeah, I mean, and that makes sense. Uh, but when I think of when I think of that, I also think of, OK, if it's locked, would wouldn't it mean the doctor doesn't exist? Yeah. Uh, I, it, it hurts my brain. I, is, <laughs> we can move on. Yeah, but but maybe maybe he exists outside the lock. Meaning, you know, we know we we know from future episodes that his punishment for you know being what he did and, and the thing that he did to destroy both the Daleks and the Time Lords that that we've seen from them and leaving him as the last Time Lord. We know his punishment is to be outside of Gallifrey. So being part of that punishment or that he is, the, you know, the last time Lord, that maybe that is how he's able to still exist. Yeah, I, I, I'll take that. <laughs> good, good enough. Good enough. I, I know there probably wasn't a concrete answer to that, but I still want to pose a question because anyone who may be watching this for the first time, you know, may have that same question. Oh my God, he's a time Lord. How come he can't just go back to that era when his planet did exist? Yeah. So. And, and I'll, I'll, I will be honest with you. I, I heard people say, and I said myself when watching it, that very thing that you just said, because it makes no sense other than that's their explanation. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. I get it. I get it. But good question though. <laughs> I mean, seriously, good question. Oh, uh, so can I pose another question Absolutely, to you, sir? Absolutely, go for it. Hopefully, less uh, brain bending than that the previous one. Is there any logic whatsoever behind the doctor pulling all these levers on the console? Mm, other than irritating me when I saw it, <laughs> it, it looked absolutely hokey, and I don't know of another word. It just looked. What did you think of it? Let me turn it back on you. Yeah, I mean, at first it looks weird, but me coming from, especially as we're watching, we've been watching Star Trek Discovery, it just made me think that there may be some method to the madness. You know, maybe if you watch him do this certain thing across 10 episodes, it may start to make sense that, oh, he's kind of repeating the same pattern or he's pressing a certain level lever for this. But if it, you know, taking that out of the picture, it just looks weird. <laughs> and I don't remember David Tennant, who ha who essentially had the same, you know, for the uh, 10th Doctor, who had the same desktop theme as this one did. The um, I don't remember him using the lever. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. It just looked weird. It just looked out of place. And it was like, OK, you're trying to go steampunk with it a little bit with the whole coral reef kind of weird look of this version of the interior that I was like, okay, that it, it was just irritating. And I, and, and something wants to tell me that we don't see that happen much more as the episodes go on, even with the ninth doctor. Well, let's just relate that a little bit to classic who, um, they never have I, a lever, <laughs> never have a lever. Well, just gadgets on the console in general. Is there all? Is there a lot of button mashing, console pulling, liver, whatever it is on the console um, it, to this degree that we see here? Not to this degree. No, you you had buttons, and I'm thinking back to the Adventure in Time and Space when they were retelling the makings of the first Doctor's era, and we see 
um, David Bradley as William Hartnell and and saying, no, I can't just touch any button. I, you know, the the kids are expecting me to press this button to open the doors. You don't press that button. So I think maybe oh, different actors okay. took that, you know, to make sure that they did – you know, if I'm going to open the door, I need to make sure I'm always on this side pressing this button or vice versa. If I'm supposed to dematerialize, I don't press the same button to dematerialize as I did to open the door. Ah, cool, cool. That makes sense. Yeah, good question. Good question. So I have a question for you. So we see the face of Bo and not foreshadowing in any way, but just seeing the big head in the bottle. What did you think? I thought it was pretty cool. Um it's kind of hard to talk about this without foreshadowing, but uh, <laughs> it was cool seeing him. Uh, it seemed like I remember him being a little bit more prominent in this episode than he was, uh, but he, he was more so just a backdrop in this entire episode. Though his name was brought up a few times, but he, he really was an afterthought. But that does make me think, you know, how much of the face of Bo's arc had they planned out beyond this first season? Um I don't think they planned out very much beyond the first season because I don't think they really knew until it aired, you, you know, that there would be a second season for the most part, or, or at least at the very beginning of it. Because hmm. you have to remember, because um, I, I have to remember this too, it was almost in a way doomed per se, almost. And what I mean by that is it was announced or leaked, or maybe it maybe it was announced by that BBC a day before it started airing, but a day before the first episode aired, that Eccleston was leaving. Hmm. So you know that's almost um, for a new fan maybe that didn't know anything about Doctor Who was all right. Why should I start watching a new TV show? When the main character, the lead actor, is leaving, so it's just by the testament that it was Doctor Who that people still, in my opinion, watched, even though, you know, um, he, you know, the main character, Eccleston, was leaving. Yeah, and I wonder, did he really just foreshadow that he'd only be there for a year before he started the role? Um, and I think he did only sign on for a year, but... Again, it was only maybe just um, not auction, but uh, not sanctioned, but in other words, greenlit for one year because they wanted to see did would people even accept Doctor Who as a franchise again? Obviously, they did. But, <laughs> you know, now when they renew it for so many years, I think it's been renewed now and through, say, 2021 or 2022. So it's, you know, it's years ahead of us before it's time for you know how many more years are they going to renew it back then it was and especially in the late 80s with colin baker it was just um you know they put him on hiatus for 18 months during the colin baker year so um you know i, I don't know i don't know what do you think mm. I, I, I don't <laughs> i think we can i don't know I, mean, I think it's weird that they would do it before the season started but you know uh, maybe they'd rather go ahead and announce it rather than they seeing him sign on for something else. Um, you know, um, try to preempt that the, uh, the news leaking. So I could, I can see that, I guess. All right. So I have a question for you. Um, you know, we also see or, or just a statement. You know, we, we saw the psychic paper, which we've seen several times before, which I thought was cool. But they also did something with the doctor that I had forgotten that I really liked about Eccleston's character of how he could change the ninth doctor from being brooding and almost like bitingly cold to you to being really, really friendly and caring and, and like a split second. Did, did you pick up on that too? Hmm. You know what? I didn't really notice the him being cold as much. I kind of. I kind of pictured it as like a somewhat rude professor okay. kind of mannerism. I, 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 you know, I'd, I'd go with that. Where, where you know there's love there, but it's, uh, I don't know. I don't have a, a cold love in a way to where they're being more, um, 
I don't like a mentor. That, I don't know. I don't know how I want to explain it. <laughs> well, but I do get what you're saying. Because I'm referring to, and, and what I'm picturing is, it's it's when uh, you have Rose questioning, "Who are you, Doctor? Where you know? Where are you from? And you know, tell me more about you." And when they're watching, you know, they're sitting there and they first get there. And, and then he really kind of bites back to her, like, you know, I'm the doctor. I'm here. I'm now. That's all you need to know. And then, you know, right on the flip of that, he feels bad and gives her the upgrade to her phone so she can sit, stand on a platform in space in the future and call her mother. In the year 5.5 Alpha 26, which makes no sense to me. Uh, maybe there's some scientific thing <laughs> that year. Uh, but. But yeah, yeah, he does, he does have those moments. Uh, I mean, even when we think of the moments when he's, uh, near the end when he's with Jade and he's very personable and concerned about her in that tunnel, um, he doesn't want her to catch on fire, but you know, she makes a sacrifice. So, I mean, I do think this doctor has a lot of range and I really like that about him, but I, I honestly, I can't think of any doctor that we've had that hasn't had an equally amount of, of range to the way they act. And, and I don't know, I don't know. I really, I really like that about him. And, and those moments that, that he has with Rose are really kind of heartfelt because we know Rose has started questioning her, questioning herself when she was talking to the maintenance worker, you know, um, what, what, I don't, I don't, don't know anything about this guy, you know, <laughs> right. he jumped in a box with him and went off to the end of the world. So, um, yeah, a good, Definitely a good moment between him and Rose. Uh, another good moment that I really, really enjoyed was the moment between Rose or the conversation that she had between her, well, with Cassandra and where she's talking about, you know, uh, you're nothing but a stretched out piece of skin with, uh, you know, l- makeup and lipstick, you know, Nip-tuck I'm much flattened. <laughs> yes. And then, um, you know, Cassandra says, well, your your chin does look a little bit bulging or something. <laughs> so I'm like, really, Cassandra? But, and, you know, and that's where people get that moisturize me joke from is from Cassandra. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I've got that. Uh, but, yeah, and people like to use that, actually. But I will say that that um, it is a bit of a stretch how she's a <laughs> stretch, how she's the quote unquote last human. And she's, you know. Pretty much berating all these other offshoots of humans that we have, you know, genetically altered or not pure or um, inbred or whatever she called them. Um, but she's a piece of skin stretched on, <laughs> on a board, kind of. I don't. She's not human, and Rose puts her to task, which I was like, yes. <laughs> so, so I have a biology question that I don't quite understand. So Uh-oh. here's here's my biology question. I don't know anything about moisturizing. Okay, well, neither <laughs> ne- ne- neither do I. But having said that, for moisturizing none with <laughs> moisturizing none withstanding, where is her consciousness housed? Because I don't see a brain in that piece of skin. Hmm. Unless good it's question. Been, unless it's been flattened and uh, uh, nipped and tucked and whatever, whatever. Uh, too maybe that's the maybe that's how where her brain is yeah well i will say at the end when she actually uh dries out and kind of explodes seems like when those chunks fly through seem like i see more flesh in that than it looks from just looking at her so i don't know i guess the brain could be flattened too or maybe not. so maybe it yeah. was maybe she was just hyper condensed to, to, to flatten her out and it was somehow in the year five billion alpha pie carrot uh apple juice celery stick i don't know <laughs> um maybe maybe it was just kind of yeah sw- uh, sw- swapped off to some dimension or something but i've got a curious thing for you because uh you're into technology and you're into uh different you know things tech so what did you think about seeing the ipod that was really cool to me Wait, do we actually see the iPod? No, we yeah, we did. We saw that big, you know, thing that, that they call the iPod. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like uh the you know because it plays songs and it stored your songs in it. Yeah. And it looked like an iPod jukebox. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't exactly fit in your pocket, but hey. Yeah. Um, I thought that was funny and 
Yeah, I think the cool thing is, you know, a thousand years from now, the span of a hundred years wouldn't make much difference to the person that's a thousand years in the future. So technology that came out at the end of that of, of a hundred year period would presumably seem the same as something that came out early in a hundred year period. So, yeah, yeah. Her being so far in the future, I could see them easily getting those mixed up. I mean, I, I, I really thought that was funny. And one of two cultural references that I was I didn't remember. I didn't remember the iPod joke. And I didn't remember them playing Britney Spears Toxic, which I almost cringed when they started playing it. I was like, oh, no. Mm. And, and <laughs> Yeah, definitely dated. I mean, really, it dated it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was really weird. But if it made for a semi-good, frantic uh, montage, semi-montage there, so I don't know. Well, another thing that I noticed or that I paid attention to that – um you know, going back and watching these again and, and and trying to actually review them because I've never reviewed any of these episodes before. You know, I've seen them and we've talked about them, but I've never actually reviewed them is I still find it so Doctor Who changing in the fact that we are in a second episode with a companion and that companion is still contacting the family at home and having that relationship still at home because yeah. again in classic you didn't have that they went away they they traveled and then they hope to come back at the time and place that they left yeah and man um uh, that that's awesome and just i just want to give a nod to the writing in that moment when he fixes her phone because to me the writing in this episode is really good to have those nuanced jokes that really made me smile that I was not expecting. And they didn't really have to do like um, <laughs> the moment when she was trying to get her phone to work. And she's like uh, out of range just a bit. You know, that one little line made me, <laughs> made me smile a little bit. And this, and this episode is chocked full of those, um, you know, small moments that really kind of touch on. Yeah. And uh, speaking of this particular episode, it was, uh, written by Russell T. Davies. He, you know, he was ex executive producer, showrunner, but it, this was another one of the episodes that he, you know, actually, uh, wrote. He wrote Rose and, uh, he wrote this. Uh, curious, um, tidbit to, uh, an FYI to you. When these were originally made, and, you know, of course, you know, the schedule went out, Davies actually asked the BBC, but he asked too late. He wanted these two episodes to be aired back to back, sort of like a part one and part two, not a week apart. Do you mm. think it would have made as a more enjoyable watching experience if it were um, not, you know, two particular episodes on two different weeks, but aired specifically, you know, say at 515 and then at 615 or what? what, what do you think? Well, you know, I think it's almost impossible for for us as streaming watchers um, having the whole season watch to kind of answer that question. I know I certainly the first time when I watched these episodes, episodes, I watched them both back to back, one and two, probably watched the first five, to be honest, together. So, you know, for me, they, I did watch them together. So I did, did get his original intent. When I watched it, uh, certainly this time around, I kind of watched one and waited and watched the next uh, to take notes. But, um, yeah, I can see that being a problem for the first time viewer. You know, I think both episodes are mostly self-contained, but I can see you watching that first episode and me like that first episode in rows and being like, man, man, I really I really want to see what com comes up next. And, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I'm I, I'm agreeing with you. They are very self-contained, and, and that's true. But on the flip of that, I do like the segue that it has that you don't even really notice it at first. But this this episode here actually, you know, it starts with her running into the TARDIS. Yep. So you know, we see her running to into the TARDIS at the end, and we see her running in the TARDIS. You know, after she's done that at the beginning of this one. So I can see, like you were saying, 
if you're watching them together, whether it's streaming or whatever, it just flows from one directly to the other. And I think they did that a couple of times in this current year's season 10 yeah. series. Yeah, definitely. Those episodes definitely felt like it was one hour after a continuous story after another. Um, they definitely flowed really well together in, in sort of the same vein. Point taken. So I have a question for you, sir. All right, go for it. The psychic paper. When did it first appear? Is it a new who invention? Um, what, where did it originate? It originated, let's see, it, it was a, it first originated, uh, on an episode that aired on April the 2nd, 2005. It was second uh, <laughs> episode of the 2005 series called The End of the World, the one we are reviewing. So yeah, that was the first time we see it. Wow. That seems like an old invention. Seems like it would be very useful in times past, but. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and I remember reading a lot of people I don't that were fans of Classic Who. I think did not like the psychic paper because it was too much of a get out of jail free card. You mean more than that uh, Sonic thing? Oh, people! I don't like the Sonic uh, <laughs> Sonic thing that comes later. But yeah, uh, a lot of people didn't like this because it was like I said, a, you know, if 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 it can show anything that he wants them to see. That's literally almost a get out of jail free card. Hmm. Cause if you notice in recent years or in re- recent series, we don't see Sonic paper regardless of which doctor. We don't see that that much anymore. You really don't. You really don't. You know, uh, what's, what's, I'm, I seem like Tenet used it a lot. <laughs> T- Tenet did use it a lot. And I think that, that, that the, the interesting thing is, yes, we did see it with Tenet. But maybe we changed it when we had, uh, you know, Stephen Moffat take over. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That makes a lot of sense. Because I can't recall, you know, the 10th, I mean, the 11th Doctor or the 12th Doctor using the sonic paper, uh, the psychic paper that much. Yeah, it seems like I remember, yeah, not much, but I do remember them using it maybe once each, maybe. And not a whole lot. You maybe can count it on, on one hand the amount of times they used it. But yeah, so Rose makes this statement. Aliens are so alien. And then the doctor says, good thing I didn't take you to the deep south. Okay, what the heck is the deep south a reference to? And I just want to know if I'm reading into this role. Maybe. I don't know. And I actually don't remember the line, to be honest with you, believe it or not. Really? No, I don't. It's it's, it's that moment when... um. Rose first meets the maintenance person, the plumber lady. Yeah, yeah. I remember from, I mean, I know kind of where you're referring to because it's right before the scene that I referred to about where she's questioning him, right? Yeah. When yeah. they first get there. Yeah. I'll have to go so, back and watch it. So, to, so, so explain, mention it. I mean, I, I don't know this one. I mean, what is, what is he referring to? Good thing I didn't take you to the deep south. And I, I'm just, I don't know what he's talking about. I'm just trying to figure out what he's talking about that, that, is apparently alien that Rose knows about that, it, but is the deep South. Just curious. Maybe, you know, maybe I can Google it. <laughs> you, you know, I, I am sitting here being an American and that means a context that, <laughs> that you and I are seeing or, or that I think we're going toward. You know, I, I think this is a Dave Cooper question, honestly, because I'm curious to see what that reference might mean there. Hmm. Because here, here's here's why I say that this was not a fun. You know, think about it. When they were recording this, this wasn't the phenomenon TV show. Yes, it had a cult following, but it was not. You know, the, uh, the show, show that it is today. So, and you didn't have the worldwide audience per se like you do today. I'm not saying you didn't then, but not like you do today. So, I don't think that that would probably be intended as a fan service or a comment to the u.s it may have been but i'm just not sure mm. yeah yeah we'll see <laughs> i guess i'll do some research on it and maybe come back in the next episode and yeah cool see if i can figure figure out what exactly they're talking about cobain but yeah like you said definitely has different connotations for the u.s uh maybe than it does for the uk so i really you know maybe do some research on it all right so um i have a um 
you know, I, do you have anything else? Because I have a, I want to change subjects in just a moment. But um, do you have anything <laughs> else that you've noticed or commented on this particular episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a few asides. Um, the whole reason, the whole reason Cassandra is is trying to take over the observation station is for money. You know, the doctor says, you know, it still comes down to money, which is, you know, cruel. Um, <laughs> a good, fun, snide moment when uh, they're trying to find out who actually committed the crime or is trying to sabotage the station. And uh, somebody says, talk to the face. And, of course, they were referring to the face of Bo. Right. Which I thought was really funny as well. Also, from a science point of view, I thought they brought in some really cool concepts in this episode, uh, being the the concept of the gravity satellites holding back the sun from destroying the earth and the earth is more so a relic or a museum, not a museum, but a, you know, a, a landmark it a, type yeah. of thing. It, 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 it's, it's like one of those buildings you drive by that, that sees, you know, this plaque out in front of it. I mean, that's basically, you know, like it is a museum. Yeah. And they were keeping the planet preserved. So, I just wanted to point out those few sci-fi concepts from this episode that I really loved. And again, like I said before, for the time, the special effects, which this episode was special effects heavy from the space station to the views we were getting outside of the, the window and Rose was about to be killed. And, you know, I, I, it was pretty fairly good special effects in this show. Um, also, we have to mention one thing we have not mentioned. Rose almost dies in this episode. On mm-hmm. her first adventure, she almost dies, which I think is really, really heavy. And I can't remember the next episode, but I want, I'm thinking she's going to have some real reservations about running off with this mysterious guy the next time. But I, I don't, I can't remember. So we'll see. Yeah. If I remember correctly, well, I know what the next episode is, is, uh, you're setting the past. I'll, I'll put it that way. So they do go into the past in this next episode. So, mm. um, you know, an, another thing that I noticed w- with Rose um, in this episode, once again, and you've you've made reference to this, but once again, she shows herself not to be a wallflower. You know, she's she's walking around on a space station five million years or billion years in the future without the person that brought her there. And, you know, there are people who would probably be terrified, number one, to even be there. And number two would be right up under the person that they because they'd be afraid that what if he leaves me? And again, she doesn't know this guy. She's met him once. I mean, literally or a couple of, you know, over a couple of days, period. And and now she's five billion years in the future. She has something in her that trust him. To not just leave her there. But isn't that kind of the, I'm not going to say stereotypical, but isn't that kind of the story that you hear of a, 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 a young, you know, coming of age girl meeting a guy she loves, falls in love with, and they run off to another part of the country uh, together, and she really doesn't know anything about the guy, you know? <laughs> True. True. If you put it in that context, that's no different from like what, you, what you said. What if somebody had never been out of the state that they lived and they met someone and went 10 states across and doesn't know anybody there. And then that person leaves them and they're stranded. Well, that's the same scenario that I just described at 5 billion years in the future. So you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, another like point that like really jumped out at me that reminded me a lot of bill is um, the fact that Rose in that moment before Cassandra is kind of uh, explodes or whatever, um, she makes the statement, help her. And I could see Bill saying those same words uh, uh, very 10 seasons from now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, I could too. But very reminiscent. Very reminiscent. And, you know, that is one thing that is a common theme throughout Doctor Who is the companion is there to serve in many ways as the voice of reason. You ever notice that? Yeah. And one of my favorite ones is a quote that a future companion, Donna, is going to actually make, which is, she says, because somebody has to stop you. Yeah. 
You know, yeah. that's why you have people is because that somebody needs to stop you. And that's that's true, you know. So if I were to ask you uh, good comments, by the way, uh, any other um, any other uh, thoughts on uh, this particular episode? Um, I'll just add that moment we see the doctor in the tunnel and these blades are kind of, you know, in his way to restore the shields to the, the observation tower. Uh, or ship and he kind of just uses his takes a leap of leap of faith or use some i don't know what happens <laughs> he digs deep to get past his last blade and i thought that was really cool and yeah yeah that kind of surprised me i didn't remember that but it was good seeing it again yeah good good special effects too by the way oh yeah all right if i were to ask for a rating one to five what would you give this episode? Hmm, man, this is hard. Um, I would say a four. Um, gr- good story, very much enjoyable. Um, a, a few twists and turns in there. Um, I think it was a fairly solid up. Let me say three point eight to four, somewhere in there. Three point eight to four. I think I really enjoyed it. And I think any new who watcher will enjoy it as well. What about yourself, man? I'm going to agree with you. Um, I'm going to say a th- about a 3.8 to 4, maybe a 4.2 if I were to like be really, really generous. Because if I go into the context of me watching this in 2005, seeing Doctor Who back on the air and knowing as a classic Who fan what the production was, um, you know, at the time that it was and seeing all this like high tech, um, you know, visuals. And I, I would almost give it a 4.5 if I'm actually now sitting here thinking about it because it was a solid story. It had a conclusion. It had an enemy. It had concepts. It had interaction. It, I, I just think it was a good episode. So I'm, yeah, I'm going to raise it up to a mind to be about a 4.5. <laughs> yeah, and I have to think, man, how many episodes have we had with the end of in the title? Because <laughs> it seems like I've heard, I remember a few, but I don't know. Yeah, so I would um, follow that up with how many have we had of the Daleks? We've, you know what I'm saying? We yeah, had yeah, yeah. the destiny of the Daleks, the genesis of the Daleks, the day of the Daleks, the uh, remembrance of the Daleks, the. Return of the day. I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we've even had an episode that we're going to be reviewing soon just called Dalek. So the question or the final question that I have is for anyone listening, if you don't agree or do agree with our ratings that we've given, or if you have a completely different rating, we would love to hear it. So we want your feedback. So you can send us your feedback by sending us an email to discussing who at gmail.com you can record a voice greeting you know to use it on your iphone your android phone email it to us you can also give us a call at 805-850-3946 and make sure you check out our patreon uh you can find that at patreon.com slash discussing who uh we're n- <sighs> now you got me messed up <laughs> okay okay got it <clears throat> Hey guys, also check out our Patreon that is at patreon.com slash discussing who. Uh, first and foremost, we want you guys to subscribe to the podcast if you like it. That's the best way you can help the show. But if you want to chip in a little bit more, check out our Patreon and, uh, whatever you can give, uh, we definitely appreciate it. And again, we want your feedback. We, we want to hear from you. You can send it and we'll read it on the show, but we want to know what you're thinking, know what you are liking. And we want to also thank Thomas again, the gentleman who gave the list of things that he wanted us to review. I actually uh, replied back to him and we just want to say thank you, Thomas. Uh, we appreciate it and we're glad you're enjoying the episodes. And before we go, I do want to mention one thing, and I know this is comic book related and also check out our new uh comic book related podcast discussing comics you can find that at discussingcomics.com but uh, i want to mention something that our friend matthew uh, did mention whenever i saw him recently at the local comic shop and i just want to give a shout out to him 
I uh, had been talking about, I think it was in our Justice League review about how I didn't like Jack Kirby's Fourth World. And, you know, Matthew said, you know, I just got to tell you, you know, I know you didn't like the Fourth World, but you really need to check out Mr. Miracle. And so, you know, Matthew, I am going to check out at least one episode of Mr. Miracle, but the last time I said I will check out one episode that was of The Walking Dead for a guess, <laughs> as Seska says, and now I'm in season three. So who knows? I may be a fourth world, uh, you know, doctor, I mean, excuse me, Dark Seed fan. So Matthew just wanted to say I will check out Mr. Miracle. Cool beans. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, again for listening, and we will be back next time. You've been listening to the Discussing Who podcast. Discussing Who is made by fans for fans. No copyright infringement is intended. Show us your fans of the show by liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter. You can find us on the web at www.discussingwho.com. Want more Discussing Who? Find us on iTunes, Google Play Music, Player FM, the Doctor Who Podshock Alliance, and more. Send us your feedback to discussingwho at gmail.com, or if you'd like, simply record a voice message and send that to us via your smartphone, tablet, or computer. We want to hear from you.